In particular, let's look at some isometries. There's a well-known reflection. I use a common word, but using it in a very precise mathematical sense. It's a mapping. A reflection in the line is a mapping. There's an object, there's its image. There's an object, there's its image. This correspondence maps distinct points to distinct points and preserves distance. It's a mathematical reflection. Consider a rotation of the plane, where I have a fixed point, and think of the entire plane as rotating. But focus your attention on the correspondence that is produced, the correspondence between initial point and its final position. It is this correspondence which I call the rotation. Although there is a motion going on, the motion itself doesn't interest me. It's the correspondence from initial to final position that I call the isometry. A translation has the same sort of properties. Think of the entire plane as sliding. For every initial point, there is a final point. It's this correspondence which I call a translation. It preserves distance. It's one to one. The combination of a translation and a reflection in a line parallel to the translation is an isometry from initial point to final point, which I call a glide reflection. A glide reflection because there is a glide and a reflection involved. So we have discussed four different isometries, reflections, rotations, translations, and glide reflections. Particular by means of isometries, because an isometry is just a mathematical abstraction of the idea of lifting up a triangle and putting it down somewhere else. Now what we want of this physical process is that everything remains rigid. Angle measure doesn't change, lengths don't change, and so on. And that's precisely what an isometry is. An isometry is a distance-preserving transformation. So the length of the sides remain the same. And it's very easy to prove that if you have distance preserving as the essential property of the transformation, then angle measure is also preserved. And this is, as I say, precisely what you want in the theory of congruence. A person will still have to read a book and get more out of it, but I think that we can make a movie illustrating these half a dozen points. Well, one question, one fundamental question that always arises in producing a 10-minute film on a subject such as this is, will it have meaning? Uh, what kind of motivation do you use? Can you, in this short period of time, indicate to the viewer why anyone ever bothers with isometries? Think of this sheet as extending over the entire plane. And suppose I apply some motion to the plane. Then a mapping is determined. Every point had an initial position, and it has a final position when the motion is finished. So this motion has determined the correspondence of a correspondence which assigns to every point in its initial position the point which is its final position. And it's this correspondence, which I call an isometry. It has the following uh, properties. Every point has an image. Distinct images, different points go into different points. So the mapping is one to one. And furthermore, the distance between any two points is equal to the distance between their images. It preserves distance. A mapping of the plane with these properties is called an isometry. Two are all the big arrows on at the same time? Oh, probably just one might do it. Maybe, in fact, maybe we should put one down. Longer one. 
we should put one down and then lift it up and move it to another, show it in a couple of positions. Pop it? Uh, like that, yeah. yeah. Pop it in and out. One from one place to another. And then move the pad. Yeah, and then I think each time we'll, we'll put the arrows down and show which direction we're going in and do it. Put the arrows back down afterwards and if we don't like one or the other, we'll cut it out. Uh, mathematically, an isometry is a one-to-one -one transformation of the plane which preserves distance. How do we visualize it? Well, if you think of this, this pad as, as the plane, then you may pick it up, move it around, even flip it, and arrive at a final position. Uh, this motion is not the isometry. The isometry is the correspondence between the initial and final points. Uh, a point A point in the initial position has moved into a final position. Every point has an initial and a final position in some isometry. It's this correspondence which is the isometry. A line determines a reflection. A reflection is an opposite isometry. This means that if a point traces a closed curve in a clockwise direction, its image traces the image curve in a counterclockwise direction. An opposite isometry is sense reversing. Any point in its image are joined by a segment which is right bisected by the line of reflection. Any point on the line of reflection is its own image. All the points on this line are invariant. On the other hand, a translation has no invariant points. Since a translation is determined by a length and a direction, it is conveniently represented by an arrow from any point to its image. A translation is a direct isometry. It preserves sense. A point and a directed angle determine a rotation. The point, called the center of the rotation, is invariant. Any other point and its image are equidistant from the center. A rotation, like a translation, is a direct isometry. A glide reflection is the net effect of a reflection followed by a translation parallel to the line of reflection. Because of this parallelism, the same net effect would be produced by applying the translation first, and then the reflection. Like a translation, a glide reflection has no invariant points. And like a reflection, it is an opposite isometry. Reflection, translation, rotation, glide reflection. I have described four different kinds of isometries. But are these the only kinds of isometries? For example, is a product of a translation and a rotation one of these four types? Even simpler, what sort of isometry is obtained by taking the product of two reflections? Well, why don't we just set up uh, down the studio, we'll establish a plane, put down some uh, tape and go along, and, and uh, uh, as we go along, I'll, I'll do it, in a sense, my way, visually, and it's you funny. tell me where, where we, uh, we need the, uh, uh, where the mathematics is failing. We'll just try it, we'll run through it a few times and see if we can get something. Well, let's start with the, uh, the intersecting mirrors first. Well, first of all, I, I draw a line of a reflection. Well, how do you get this across? Well, we'll just put down a piece of tape to, uh, to represent the... Now, do you want to put both of them down, or should we start with just no, one? No, just, I think we'll start with one. Okay. Uh, fine. T take a particular point, uh, like I'm calling it P here, and I'm going to, I pick up its image mathematically as follows. I drop the perpendicular to the line of reflection. I go the same distance to the other side. I pick up its image, P prime. Do we really have to use a line in this case? Can't we, for instance, let's use those two-way mirrors. Let's set it on, actually on the line of reflection mm -hmm. and look in it and see the image of the point and put a point down on the other side and swing around and see it to see that we've established uh, we, the P prime. So if I put right. the, I'll, I'll put the mirror down and uh, and we'll, we'll look right, through and, 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 yes, and then we don't have to put another piece of tape uh, down to show that... Yes, but you'll just see an image. When you remove the mirror, the image will be gone. 
No, we'll, we'll put the image on the other side as well. You can see through the mirrors. And oh, uh, fine. Uh, let me now put down the line of the second reflection and uh, find the image of P prime, that is the image of the image, in this uh, second reflection. Again, I drop the perpendicular to the second line of reflection and go the same distance on the other side. Call the final image P double prime. Uh, somehow or other through this, we've got to get across the, this notion that y you've talked about of products. Yes, well, we started with a point. We found its image under the first isometry. It happens to be a reflection in this case. Then, then we found how a second isometry affects this image, leading us to a final point. From an initial point to a final point, we have a mapping. And it's this mapping which is the product of the isometries. I, perhaps it'll be clearer if we do this with a couple of more points. So yeah. perhaps we should do that next. But for example, take a second and third point, drop the perpendicular to the first mirror to find their images in the first reflection, drop their perpendiculars to the second mirror to find the final, final images. Now I have three points uh, and their final images. And I want to prove that this mapping is a rotation. Well, it's clear that the point of intersection of the two lines of reflection is an invariant point. So that will uh, be the center of the rotation. To complete the proof, I require the following two properties, that any point and its image are the same distance from the center, and that the angle thus formed is a constant. Well, and now th this will get rather involved. Uh, could we, for instance, take, take the center of the, uh, or the uh, intersection of the two mirrors, which is the invariant point, and drop down some kind of transparent uh, material and, and cover these points and swing them around to show that this is a rotation. Is that enough uh, for well, the proof? Or? Yes, I think that would do it. It isn't, uh, it isn't a, a real mathematical proof, but... Th and then for the, uh, uh, the double angle. Well, here you, you could also uh, use the, uh, the, the transparent sheet and, and actually double the angle, somehow get a show visually that you're doubling the angle, and then compare the angle from, uh, from uh, formed by any point of image and the intersection in a mirror. Do this for several points to see that that angle is, is the same size. Do you think we should deal with the uh, uh, positioning of these mirrors, that it's uh, uh, independent of, the, of this particular rotation? Should we show some other position of, of this? Yes, well, that's a very important point. Uh, any two other mirrors which intersect in the same point and have the same angle will have the same product because it's the point and the angle which determine the product. Yeah. So uh, we will have to get this across visually. Well, maybe just take one other position. Yes, just, just, just move the mirrors to another position and try to establish that, that we haven't changed this angle. Yes, well, and one of the... Use the same center and, uh, and go through another reflection and then the, the first reflection and then the second reflection and show yes, that the initial and final positions have not... Uh, exactly, that's what, that's what I, I will want to see, that the f starting with the, the, with the same f initial point, the f its image will change because the first mirror will change, but the image of the image won't change. Yeah. If, if you can do that, uh, fine, then you really, uh, you really got the point across. And we have, we have the first major theorem for us in, the, uh, in, in the, the, the products of isometries, the product of two reflections of rotation, and that rotation may be expressed in many ways as the product of two reflections. We'll need this when, we're going, when we analyze products of isometries later on. And uh, then I want to do the... Uh, uh, this whole thing again through uh, for parallel reflections, but that there'll be some other problems coming in there. Well, we shouldn't have too many problems. Why can't we just run through this the way that we uh, we did with the uh, two intersecting mirrors? All right, here's a line of reflection. Here are three points, and here are there. Yeah, images. we can we can take the, the all three points this time right through, can't we? Instead of exactly uh, instead of starting with a single one and so on, we'll start with three. Fine. So we find. We have three images in the first reflection. And now, here's a second reflection parallel to the first one. And I see three images 
I have three images in this second reflection. And now, forget or erase the intermediate points. Now we don't need uh, we don't need perpendiculars between the points here either, do we? Can we just use the mirrors and find their reflections like we did before? C certainly. And in fact, that gives us right away that in this product, if you just look at the first, at the three original points and their Im and their final images, you have immediately that the join of each point and its image is perpendicular to both mirrors. But uh, how, how, how do you get across that the length uh, of the segment joining each point to its image is, is constant? What if we uh, took a piece of tape or, or some kind of measuring device, something that we could cut to the length of, uh, of, one of the of distance these. between two points, between a point and its final image? and then move that over and put it on the next one and, and, and the next one and so on. That'll do it, but then we will still have to show that that length is just twice the distance between the mirrors. You know, supposing we put the arrow or the line or whatever we use on the, on the edge of one mirror, on the edge of, one, of the first reflection, and then put the, uh, the mirror on uh, the second line of reflection so that we see that it's oh, still the... Oh, yes, that'll do it. Uh, now, we have that the product of two reflections is a translation through twice the distance between the mirrors in the perpendicular direction. It follows... This, in other words, this translation is determined by the uh, direction perpendicular to the mirrors and the distance between the mirrors, and not just the mirrors themselves. In other words, any two other parallel reflections with the same distance between them is parallel to the, these two. Uh, their product will be the same translation. And we, we want to get this across visually. I guess the thing to do is to pick up the two mirrors and move them together to a new position and pick up a different set of intermediate points but realize that the, if you start with the same initial positions, you end up with the fi same final positions as you had in the first case. Yeah. We well, well, maybe we, uh, maybe if we just, you know, move the mirrors, and, and again, if we if we quicken our steps here a little bit, if we just move the mirrors back and forth, maybe you can just simply say that the distance between the uh, the points in their images won't change at all. So that takes care of the product of two reflections. I could go on to consider the product of three reflections, or four, and so on, but it isn't necessary, because I can prove that any isometry is the product of, at most, three suitably chosen reflections. Why don't I prove this now, and then I'll return to the product of three reflections. Well, suppose I have a triangle placed anywhere, and I take a congruent triangle anywhere else in the plane. I'm going to find three reflections which will transform the first triangle into the second one. Of course, I have to choose them carefully. I do it as follows. Consider any pair of, uh, of corresponding points and the line segment joining them. I right bisect that line segment and perform a reflection in that black line. Now I join a second pair of corresponding points, say these two, right bisect that line segment. It of course goes through the common point through the previous two triangles. Now, a reflection in this line takes this triangle to that position. Clearly, a third reflection finishes the job. And you see, first reflection 
takes the original triangle into that one, the second reflection takes the image into that one, the third reflection finishes the job. Well, in the case where no reflections were necessary, the uh, isometry is just the identity, and we're done. We know, we know what it is. If uh, the isometry is a single reflection, you pick up a single line, and we know what that sort of isometry is, what it does to the plane. If, the, if two reflections were necessary to do the job, two situations arise. Either those two reflections are intersecting or parallel. In the first case, the product is a rotation. The product is a rotation. In the second case, the product is a translation. In fact, the rotation would be indicated perhaps by such a symbolism. There's a center rotation and there's the angle, twice the angle between the mirrors. And in this case, the translation is indicated by such an arrow. It remains to consider the case where the isometry is a product of three reflections. Now, what are the possible positionings of three mirrors? I think I can do away with that. Three mirrors are either all parallel, and I permit in this case uh, where two of the mirrors are identical. Or the mirrors all have a common point. Or two are parallel and a third one intersects them. Or the three mirrors are form uh, an honest to goodness real life triangle. Let's consider this last case. We have seen that, given any pair of reflections, there are many other pairs having the same product. In the present case, that is the product of reflections in lines one, two, and three, lines one and two intersect, and so they can be replaced by any pair intersecting at the same angle, in the same point. Choose the new pair one and two, so that reflection two is perpendicular to reflection three. Now two and three, which are perpendicular, can be replaced by any other perpendicular pair intersecting in the same point. Choose the new reflections two and three, so that three is perpendicular to one. Thus, we have replaced the original reflections by new reflections one, two, and three, having the same product. Now the product of reflections one and two is a translation parallel to reflection three. The product of one, two, and three is seen to be a glide reflection. We've taken care of this case and seen that the product of these three reflections is a glide reflection. There are three cases still to be considered. Using the same techniques as we did before, I could prove that here the product of the three reflections is again a glide reflection. The product here is a single reflection, and the product of the three parallel mirrors is again a single reflection. So that, in summary, the product of any three reflections is either a glide reflection or a single reflection. The isometry which relates a pair of distinct congruent triangles can be expressed as the product of one, two, or three reflections. If one reflection completes the mapping, the isometry is simply the reflection. If two reflections are sufficient, the isometry must be a rotation or a translation. If three reflections are necessary, the isometry must be a glide reflection.
certainly the number of distinct isometries in three dimensions is greater than that uh, yes. the plane. Well, the, the, the corresponding theorem is that the isometry in the three dimensions is the part of the, the most four reflections. Reflection is now a reflection of space. And of course, there are, there are a greater variety of considerations for space. So we have a greater variety of isometries. It's not a very good Now, is the reduction of four reflections. 